don't know if you've noticed this. How can you not notice this? Um, the world we live in has become these days more and more hostile to Christianity, especially in this country in which we live. Um, some are hostile to it because of what the Bible says about things like abortion and, and marriage and, and human sexu sexuality, because we live in a kind of a you-do-you -you culture. Sometimes it's caused about wrong ideas about what the Christian faith is all about or who Jesus is. And I could say a lot about those two things, but I'm not going to. Because I believe one of the biggest reasons most people are turned off by Christianity is so-called Christians. By the actions and poor witness, sadly, of those claiming to follow Jesus. And if you're a Christian, that's something you need to take personal responsibility for. And as a church, Bethany Chapel, brothers and sisters here, we need to take collective responsibility for that as well. Our Christian witness, as we've seen so far in the book of Philippians, this letter from Paul to a small local church, has shown us that that witness is a crucial means God uses of drawing others to, not from, Jesus. And as we near the very end of this book, next week is the last week in Philippians, this personal letter to this local church in ancient Philippi, Paul has some words of encouragement to them. Well, let's listen in as we read today's next to last passage in Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. It's page 923 if you want to pull out a pewback Bible in front of you. Uh, it's page 1166 in the large print. Austin will put it up for us as well. Hear now God's word. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, give us humble hearts as we receive your word this morning. Overcome those things within us which keep us from reflecting Jesus well to each other and to our neighbors. I ask your spirit to make my words faithful to yours. Grow us in your grace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Christians in ancient Philippi, uh, the Christians that were receiving this letter, this, local church, this little local church in Philippi, they really weren't that different from us when you really get down to it. I mean, yes, their two cultures are very dissimilar, and technology, I suppose, has advanced, but when you get down to it, people are people. If you notice that, as we, as we look at the scriptures over thousands of years, people are still people. And Christians are people who are supposed to be different. Christians are people who are supposed to be transformed by God's Holy Spirit through our faith in Christ, both then and today. And in this next to last passage in Philippians, we see that Christian community is marked by unity and by joy. Christian community is marked by unity and joy. If you've truly been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, where Jesus lived, died, rose again from the dead for our forgiveness, if you've been changed by the gospel, then those two marks of Christian community should be evident within us, to each other and to the world around us. So let's start by looking at this first mark of gospel life, which is unity. Now, who thinks it would be cool to have your name in the Bible? 
Put like, you want to have your name in the Bible, right? Yeah, it'd be kind of cool, right? Unless your names are Yudio, uh, Yodia, wait a minute, let me, let me, I gotta look at it to make sure I pronounce it right. Yodia and Syntyche, right? Not because their names are so weird, but because these two Christian women were in a conflict with one another. It's such a big conflict that Paul thought it necessary to write about it. And not only did he write about it in some obscure letter that we're reading 2,000 years later, not that obscure, actually, it's very popular, but, you know, a small letter. He, he was writing this letter to the whole church, the church that they were going to. And Paul writes to the whole church, verse 2, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And so this word entreat isn't a word you use all the time, right? I entreat you to, right? We don't say that. What it means is like, I strongly urge you. And Paul urges both of them. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche. Right? They both have an urgent relation, a responsibility for the relationship. And it doesn't matter which one is wrong and which one is right. It doesn't matter who's at fault. It doesn't matter if it's 50-50. It doesn't matter if it's 70-30. It doesn't matter if it's 90-10. Or even if 100% of the fault is one and none of the other. They equally share the responsibility, according to Paul, to resolve the conflict as completely and quickly as possible. And this is very instructive because did you notice that Paul doesn't tip his hand as to who he thought maybe was responsible and who wasn't or how much or any of that? He doesn't say, I entreat you both. Calls them out individually. And he directs them both to resolve it. Now notice what he asks them to do. He doesn't just say, agree, does he? If you look there at verse 2, he says, agree what? In the Lord. Agree in the Lord. And I wish they, they translated it differently because that word agree is the word one. In other words, be one in the Lord, ladies. They are both part of the body of Christ. Christ's body must not be divided against itself. Remember Paul's words to this little church back in chapter 2 when he said, Philippians 2, 1 and 2, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, in other words, if you're really a believer, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. In other words, if you really believe what you claim to believe about Jesus, if you're really trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then our common unity in Jesus is going to show. It is going to shine out to one another, and it's going to shine out to people outside the body who don't know Jesus yet. We live in such a divided world. And I'm not just talking about social media. It is everywhere. Politics, the workplace, school, neighborhoods. Everywhere it's division. Everywhere. And so in a world of division, our unity in the body is going to stand out. It, it, it's going to glorify God. It's going to attract others to Jesus. And so we all have a responsibility to Christ to seek healthy reconciliation with all people. Remember Paul's words a year or so ago when we were in the book of Romans. He said, Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all people. In other words, if you can't forgive and reconcile your relationships within the body of Christ and you're holding back and doing so, it brings into question the sincerity of your own faith. Strong words, but that's what Paul is saying. You are being self-righteous. You are being self-justifying. You are demonstrating your, your disregard for the body of Christ and for the gospel itself, which is the very root of our faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ, where we declare our dependence on Jesus for our righteousness, for our justification. When your attitude is using Paul's term, in the Lord, your union with Christ informs and it empowers that right attitude. When Yodia and Syntyche focus in life is on the Lord, their attitude towards one another will be the same as Jesus Christ. They'll take on the form of a they will humble, not exalt themselves, Philippians 2, 5. But here's the problem. You and I struggle with humility. Everyone in this room struggles with humility. We have, as Paul 
Tripp calls it, this inner lawyer, right, who is pleading our defense in the court of self-righteousness all the time. I know mine is often on the defense when someone comes to me, like they're wagging their finger or they're complaining about something, you know, that I've done, <clears throat> whether I'm right or wrong, right, my inner lawyer starts going, building the defense, like they haven't even got it all the way out, and I'm already building that defense. Anyone relate? <clears throat> And our broken nature is wired that way to validate ourselves instead of resting in the perfect validation we already have through Christ and what he's done in the cross and the resurrection. We have a, a verdict there already, and that verdict is not guilty in Jesus Christ. And so in these conflicts, the body of Christ is called, according to Jesus in Matthew 18, to come alongside our brothers and sisters. And that's what Paul is asking us to do in verse 3. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul is asking this true companion. We don't know who this person is. It's probably the pastor of that church. It could be the elders of that church. It could even be Timothy, who, who possibly was there, to help these women. Literally, that word means to seize, to grab a hold of these women, to help them resolve this conflict. Apparently, Paul somehow knew that these women had no interest in or, or, or weren't working to resolve the conflict on their own. Perhaps, perhaps one of them didn't want to wasn't willing to meet face to face. They were avoiding each other. So Paul seeks a go-between from the church to come alongside them. And the interesting thing to know here is that these two women were quite active in gospel ministry. They labored side by side with each other, right? That's a word Paul uses a lot here in Philippians. Side by side in the battle for the gospel together. Right? There used to be no separating them from their gospel work. They were shoulder to shoulder with Paul in ministry. And I find that kind of encouraging, actually, because that means no one is beyond need of God's help. Right? We need help from each other all the time, right? And, and, and it shows you that, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the only Christian superstars in the faith, right? We all need help at times. We are in a body with each other. We don't just do the solo Christian thing up here because the Lord knows that we need each other. We need help from each other in the body. So I find this very encouraging. Here are these two women. They're, they're out in ministry. They're working together, and now they can't get it together. No wonder we can't get it together. One last thing. Paul, again, grounds these two ladies in their conflict, in their status, in their identity in Christ. You see, these women were not only fellow workers. Paul says their names are written in the book of life. Their names are written in the book of life in the book of life. In other words, they're citizens of heaven, right? And that's where they need to be pointed. Even Jesus' disciples needed that kind of pointing, needed that sort of refocusing. Remember Jesus sent out the 72, the 72 disciples, right? And what do they do? They, they come back rejoicing that even the demons are subject to them. And how does, right, woohoo, ministry success, right? And how does Jesus respond? Luke 10, 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written where? In heaven. We don't know if, if both of them or, or either of them agreed to the help in their conflict or if it was even resolved, but we do know that whatever happened is going to affect the witness of the church one way or the other. And that's a great segue to the other mark of Christian community, Paul points us to, which is joy. Joy. He says, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And Paul is using this as a bridge um, between this conflict into kind of a related topic on, on, on our witness. He, he, he's, he, he's pointing um, beyond them, but, but also to them. Because if you're rejoicing in God's mercy and goodness, you're not so likely to pile it on your fellow Christian. You'll, you'll be quicker to reconcile in a real conflict. How many times has Paul mentioned joy or rejoicing in this book? Like a gazillion, right? He is mentioning it, seems like every other verse he's mentioning this. Joy and rejoicing, it's constant. And what does Paul say about rejoicing? When do we do it? Weekly? Daily? Hourly? Regularly? What does he say? Always, right? Rejoice always. 
He's saying that our rejoicing in Christ is what? A constant thing. It is ongoing. It is a state of being. Uh, of being. And hear me on this. Christian joy is not dependent on your circumstances. Christian joy is not dependent on your circumstances. That's what Paul's saying, right? It depends on your relationship with Jesus Christ, is his point here. Not on your circumstances. Rejoice always doesn't mean rejoice when things are going great, when we can say thank you, Jesus, right? It's thank you, Jesus, all the time. It depends on your relationship with Jesus. Which tells us that if we're having a joy problem, the problem is probably, at least it is for me usually, that I'm too focused on myself. I am way too focused on myself and my circumstances. Always the case when I lack joy. And I want to be real clear about this because sometimes we, 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 we hear the world, our, our culture use the word joy. Paul's not advocating some sort of positive mental attitude here, right? He's not saying, cheer up, have a nice day, right? He's not like that. And he's saying, I rejoice, Philippians 3.10, that I know Jesus in the power of his resurrection. That's what I'm rejoicing in, Paul says. And do you think that Paul knew better than anyone? He did about suffering. Did he not? Think of all the things that happened to the Apostle Paul. He suffered as much as anyone. And he knew that rejoicing and suffering are not opposite realities. Right? They, they can coexist because we know Jesus. And again, our Christian witness to encourage one another and draw others to Christ is affected by it, which is why Paul said, verse 5, let your reasonableness be known, right? In other words, the church's reputation to who? Everyone, the Lord is at hand. In other words, let people see the joy of Jesus in conflict, right? Because he's saying the church's reputation is at stake. He's saying, knock it off, the Lord is at hand. Paul says he's not far away. He's coming back soon, so there's no time for selfishness. There's no time for our lukewarm faith. There's no time to get caught up in all these worldly things that we think are going to save us when we've already been saved by Jesus Christ. Which is why Paul continues, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Do you hear what he's saying here? He's saying that Anxiety is contrary to joy. We often think of peace being the opposite, right, uh, of, of anxiety. But so is joy, Paul is saying. And notice how Paul says, don't be anxious about what? Anything. Right, he's using a lot of these things. Everything's, anything's, always, right? right? Th- these are not like wishy-washy. Do not be anxious about anything. There's no reason for anxiety in the Christian life, Paul is saying. And when you find yourself anxious, worrying is not the proper response, but prayer is. Prayer with supplications, he means. Supplications are just like these urgent pleadings, right? We have a a prayer request that we are just coming before God with, like a need that we have. That's what supplications are. He's saying lift them up, and lift them up with thanksgiving, which really means recognizing who God is, confident in God's response. And Paul is just meeting us at every turn of this book, and even this passage, with a reminder of the gospel of Jesus, because he knows that our anxiety isn't simply because we have poor coping strategies. Right? A lot of times we told our anxiety is because we have poor coping strategies. Paul's telling us, your anxiety is a symptom of your misplaced trust, that your heart is set on something that you're terrified of losing, that you're so desperately holding on to for dear life. And these can be good things. These can be a person. This can be your, your work. It can be your knowledge. It can be your success, right? But they become your ultimate thing, Paul. Is. They become your anchor. They become your rock. They become your center of gravity when Jesus needs to be that center of gravity in your life. Right? You're putting your trust in these other things, and that's why you're anxious, not in Jesus. So Paul says, bring it to the Lord and fix your eyes there. Reminds me of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the, who made heaven and earth, who will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Which is why we need to pray. 
and pray and pray and pray and pray dot 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 and pray <laughs> we need to be praying all the time especially when anxiety strikes especially when fears become overwhelming and what happens when you do paul says something incredibly supernatural happens when we're anxious and we're praying the way he asks us verse 7 and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding in other words probably common day so I'm sure some translation probably has this, will blow your mind, right? And the peace of God, which will blow your mind, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And what he's saying literally is that the peace and joy in Jesus will guard, will literally wall off, will, will block anxiety and steal hope and joy and peace in your heart. What a promise. That is a promise, right? What a weapon against anxiety, you know, it's not that God grants us whatever we ask for, like, you know, I don't know, Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl this year or something. Right? God doesn't, doesn't offer us he doesn't answer you know, every prayer that we want, every prayer we have the way we, we want. And that's not what this is. This is actually way better than anything you could come up with. God promises to grant you a peace in Jesus that's unlike any human manufactured peace that you can even imagine in your brain. Right? right, Your life is blowing up like it's exploding all over the place. And yet you've got peace. Yet you are rejoicing in the goodness of God. And to the world around us, that makes zero sense. Right, No human sense. But yet I know many of you in this room know exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. You've experienced it. And it does surpass all human understanding. Literally blows your mind that God has given you that kind of peace. All the prayer. And as we all know, the world sees it, right? The world sees when that happens in our lives. And what do you think that does? It points them straight to Jesus. Because there's no other explanation. You're not that good. I am not that good. But Jesus is. You know, one of the greatest sources of anxiety in our lives is lies, right? The lies that we believe in our heads. Is that not one of the greatest sources of anxiety? You might hear it say something like, you're ugly, you're not enough, right? You're not smart enough, no one likes you. God's mad at you because of what you've done. He hates you, right? On and on and on, right? You probably know some of those lies. I do. Paul says, verse 8, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, Paul says, think about these things. Right? And there's probably as many of those things as there are in their sermons about each one of those things. Paul's saying, memorize it. And to help you, in the back of the sanctuary, I've printed that verse out if you want to grab one, right? Take it. Put it in front of you. Put it on your desk. Put it in your car. Probably going to put it on my nightstand next to my bed when I can't sleep at night, right? These things Paul mentions are what pushes out the anxiety, right? Truth, not lies. What is honorable, which means just what is God glorifying? What is just or righteous? What is lovely? Like, think about Jesus. He's pretty lovely. Whatever is commendable, it means, <laughs> that's such a cool word, it means literally shouting out what God has done for you. Excellent things, and that relates to our spiritual growth. Praiseworthy things, the things that cause you to rejoice like God's attributes, like God's sovereignty, like God's all presence, like his love, like his goodness. In other words, look at what God is doing in your life and in the world. And he's saying, don't think about all the bad things. Don't think about all the things that you know, are on your list to do tomorrow. But look at what God has done and is doing all around you. Think about these things. Stay focused on these things. Literally come to this list and think about these rather than whatever you're stewing about or anxious about. And God will give you peace and joy. 
Lots of promises here from God in this passage. Because the world needs hope and the world needs Jesus. And so you and I don't want to be what keeps anyone from Jesus, from finding him, from knowing him, from knowing the forgiveness we have in Jesus, from knowing the eternal life we have in Jesus, the joy and peace that comes through faith in what he did for us in the cross and resurrection. Brothers and sisters, that is our foundation, what Jesus has done. There is no other foundation. There is no other rock. There is no other place to stand than Jesus Christ to overcome all these things and to to even overcome death. Because in Jesus, our greatest hope is found. And it's through the good news of Jesus that real heart-level transformation is fueled and is witnessed in Christian community. Which is why, Bethany Chapel, we need each other to grow in fruitfulness. We need each other. It's not just us and Jesus. We need each other. That's God's plan. And we need that to grow in fruitfulness. Paul points that out in verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, he says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You see, our lives together in the body of Christ, when we gather together, and whenever times in this local body, in this local church, it's the place where Jesus is most magnified, where, where Christ's likeness is imparted through the Holy Spirit's work. We not only need Jesus, we need each other if we're going to point others to Jesus, not away. Speaking to the crowd of disciples, Jesus said, Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. Not go be the light of the world. I know I always point that out. But you are already, if your faith is in Jesus, you are the light of the world. That is your purpose. You are the light of the world, church. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. That's because at nighttime, all the lights of the city are shining on that hill for everyone around to see. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to... All in the house. Jesus says in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And our need for Jesus is exactly what this Lord's table is all about. And our need for each other is why it's called communion because we commune with Jesus and we commune with each other. And Ken is going to lead us in communion this morning. Okay. 